Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Rolka. Thank you for checking out my video. Questions from comments 43. There were so many cool questions that came in recently. I just wanted to dive right back in. So we're gonna do that. Thank you if you've chosen to subscribe. If you haven't yet, I hope that you'll do so now. There are many ways you can support my channel. Those are all in the description. They do include Patreon, where you can get PDFs of the practices from the videos that I release online, the warm-up videos, and even MP3s, so that you can take those practices wherever your travels may take you. We have a bit of a different format, so hopefully this will all work without too many disruptions. Question number one, do you think one can get or should try to achieve a good, a very firm vocal cord closure without training much as a beginner, such that no excess air would leak during singing ever again? Whenever we use words like ever again, we are inherently setting ourselves up for failure. Never, ever, always, we can hope for more often than not. That's a lot of what practice is about, is making it so that more often than not, we do it correctly or the way that we want to. But ever again is asking a bit much. We're only human after all. Do I think that as a beginner, as an untrained vocalist, you could achieve good vocal fold closure? Sure, you might be able to without training at all, but it would only be an accident. Even though it might be the desired result, you would only achieve it accidentally because as an untrained vocalist, you would have very little understanding of why it happened that way. And that is what training is about so that we can come to an understanding of how the mechanisms work, how we get the desired result, and then we can repeat it when we want to do that or inadvertently, not inadvertently, or choose to do something different because we don't want that result. So I can mostly, we'll just do a third. So I don't know how many times I would have to sing that before I would get it wrong. Equally, if I want to, I can do that too. And I don't know how many times I would have to intend to do that before I would make a mistake. That's extremely easy and a very easy place for me to sing. I know exactly what to do because I've done it. I couldn't even begin to guess how many times. So you might do it as an untrained vocalist. You might get that good vocal fold closure, but you wouldn't necessarily know how or why, and it is unlikely in the extreme that you would ever be able to repeat that consistently, which I would argue is necessary if you wish to perform with any degree of consistency. You have to learn to be consistent, you have to practice and train so that you get consistent results and you can rely on your voice when it's time to perform. I do hope that helps. Hey Jeff, should I practice with the same videos, exercises every day, or change the exercises every day? Hope you'll respond to my comment. Well, here I am responding to your comment. You could think about the warm-up videos as exercises. They are vocalizations. You might consider how well you're doing them, have a listen, and then make a decision based on that. You could think about them as what you might have as a weekly lesson. So you might do one video for a week and then move on. That being said, there are a lot of videos like quick tips or the shorter practices where you might only want to do them for a couple days and then move on. If you are a well-established, trained vocalist and you have a lot of technique already at your disposal, then you might find that going through them just you know, a day or two, and then moving on to another video would be perfectly fine for you. It really does depend on your existing level 
of vocal technique and how well or how poorly you are performing in the vocalizations in the videos. I know that's a little bit more of an obtuse answer. I do hope that it helps, though, just the same. Moving on. Hey, love the video, but really trying to find out what you mean by alignment. And unfortunately, I uh, lost track of which video this was to, and so I'm not exactly sure what they were referring to. They had a time code stamp in it. But I can tell you that there are two things that we talk about alignment with. One is your physical alignment. So is your head balanced over your collarbone, your clavicle? Do you have your shoulders in an upright but neither too far back nor rolled forward position? And how are you maintaining your expansion in order to facilitate apogeal breath management? The other alignment is vowel alignment. And in the vocalizations, generally speaking, we're using five vowels. E-A-A-O-U. Five cardinal vowels. And by alignment, I am telling you that we want to have a seamless performance from one vowel to the next. So, when I sing... That transition between E and A should be pretty seamless. There shouldn't be a bump. The tone quality, the intonation, all of those kinds of things should be consistent as we move from one scale or from one part of the scale with one vowel into the second half of the scale with the other vowel. And that is what I mean by alignment. When we cultivate that consistency through all our vowels, then we get really consistent vocal performance all the way through the various exercises and ultimately songs that we are singing. Great question. Thank you for asking that. Moving on. How long should someone practice for? It really depends entirely on what you're doing, where you're at, and what the needs of your repertoire or your overall desires are, that answer is going to be different for nearly everyone that we might talk to regarding their practice habits. As a general rule, however, if you are trying to make consistent progress with your voice, 10 to 15 minutes of general vocalizations would be the baseline kind of low bar to hit. If you are working on registration event practice, that will take more time. If you're working on a particular aspect of your vocal performance, like agility or flexibility or intervals that are in your repertoire, all of that would be in addition to the 10 or 15 minutes of general vocalization that you would do on a daily basis. And that would be the most important aspect of said practice, which is that it be daily. 10 or 15 minutes once a week, you're going to undo and do more damage in the time between practices than you will almost certainly ever achieve in those 10 to 15 minutes once a week. So we are talking about a daily practice here. And that is where I would suggest to you that if 10 or 15 minutes seems too much, then find what you can do every day and start with that and then move on from there. If it's five minutes, so be it. So long as you do it every day, that is where you can begin. And once that becomes a habit for you, then see if you can add a little bit more time to that or add some specialized training if you prefer. But start where you can establish a daily practice. That is far and away the most important part of this. I think I have a good idea of what expansion feels like. And we are talking about the lateral expansion of the ribcage there. 
But with, at least I assume that that's what they're talking about because I do use Apoggio later on in the question. So that's what I'm assuming is they're talking about is a lateral expansion of the ribcage. But with the engagement, is it essentially just the feeling of the stomach naturally pulling in slightly when you say the he syllable? I watched your Apoggio videos, but it always feels like I'm forcing the muscles to pull in rather than naturally. I don't know. It just feels weird to me. And that, I don't think, should be a surprise. We don't expand laterally, typically, when we're sitting around, driving in the car, watching telly, uh, to breathe. Apoggio is, in my opinion, the most powerful aspect of our singing technique. It, it is the foundation of it all. Um, but to say that it's the way that we naturally breathe, I think would be asking too much of it. That's just simply not the case. So it's going to feel a bit funny for a while. That is in fact quite natural because you're doing something that's different from what you might normally do when it comes to your breathing. If you've been singing for quite some time and not practicing Apoggio, then it's going to feel even stranger as you get into singing and are doing habitual things. You know, you have habits around your singing, and now you are doing something different, so it will feel even stranger still. There is a difference in the way that all of us experience physical sensations. So, what might feel like a gentle, insistent lifting to me may feel like quite a strenuous lifting or pulling or sucking in to you. So it's really uh, not possible for me to tell you what it's going to feel like for you. What it feels like to me is persistent. It is a persistent, consistent lifting and engagement of the core body muscles lifting towards the sternum to interact with the diaphragm, and to reinforce that lateral expansion of the rib cage. When I am practicing Apoggio, I am far more interested in that lateral expansion than I am in the contraction, the tensing of the rectus abdominal muscles or the core body muscles. If you were, quote-unquote, belly breathing in the past it is quite likely that your habit will be to really engage those rectus abdominis muscles, like the six-pack muscles. I went through quite a long phase where I was greatly over-tensing my core body muscles in an effort to practice Apoggio. I sincerely hope that you do not go through that phase, but if you do, I don't think it is unusual. Apoggio is a much more dynamic much more consistent application of energy through the core body as opposed to belly breathing, which is a lot of squeeze, 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 disengage and inhale, squeeze, 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 disengage and inhale. And Apoggio is not like that. It's much more persistent, consistent. Again, feels like a non-answer, but unfortunately, practicing will be the key for you. And especially with those exercises like the he he he's. Try to be as consistent in your engagement as you can, and especially in the pauses. So that when you're in between notes, there I'm still I'm still quite engaged. It's a persistent kind of engagement. I do hope that helps. Any suggestions for a voice that slows down on ascending melismas? I fall behind your playing and would like to keep up and eventually go faster. Just got done talking about Apoggio. That is where I would direct your attention. You are either inadvertently decreasing your engagement on those phrases or you're not 
increasing it over time as the phrase gets extended because with a melismatic phrase, you're going to keep on going and going and going. So you got all those notes that you continue to sing and your engagement will feel as if it's increasing over time because you are losing volume in the lungs. You are expelling air and so you have to take up that space. You have to keep on engaging in order to keep the pressure the same over time. So that is where I would direct your attention. If you don't have an apogeo practice, then I would highly recommend that you investigate apogeo breath management, whether it's with me on my channel or elsewhere. It will make everything better, if you ask me. Great question, though. Moving on. I understand the ideas of chest voice and head voice and falsetto, by which I mean men sounding like a woman when they sing. That is a sort of older usage of the term. I'm going to poke around. Actually, you probably can't hear me when I do that very well. Um, it doesn't really get used that way as much any longer. Nowadays, apoggio is primarily, when we use apoggio, or excuse me, falsetto, usually we're talking about an abduction or separation of the vocal folds, yet that airy sound. So if you had like a... Airy. Separation of the vocal folds. Again, people probably wouldn't think about that as falsetto there, but it's effectively the same thing. That airy sound, falsetto, it used to be an imitative uh, quality. We used to talk about it in terms of the male vocal imitating the female vocal. Anyway, but is middle voice, those notes between the first and second transition points, the same as what some call mixed voice or blend or what I think of as the passaggio? a passage as opposed to a step between chest and head voices? Looking forward to 2023 on your channel. Yep. In a word, that's about right. For the vast majority of male, like tenors and baritones, their primo passaggio will be somewhere in that general vicinity, either a half step below it or a half step above it. The secondo passaggio is generally going to be somewhere around there. Could be a half step lower, could be a half step higher. It's important to keep in mind that this is not like the top transition isn't the last thing that you can squeeze out before you then like flip into falsetto as the phrase goes. It is meant to be the place where there is a balanced transition where you can seamless tra seamlessly transition. In my experience, the vast majority of male vocalists who think that they have figured out their secondo passaggio are actually pushing it too high. And this is a big reason why they can't make a smooth transition. But I digress. The question was asking about the zona de passaggio or mixed voice, and yes, the space between the primo passaggio and the secondo passaggio can be referred to as mixed voice. I generally don't refer to it that way um, because other people use mixed voice to mean other things, and so I call it the zona de passaggio. But now that I think about it, they were asking about middle voice, and we would not in a male vocalist, refer to that as middle voice. Middle voice is usually, as far as I am aware, exclusively, when we use the term, phrase middle voice, we're talking about the space between the primo passaggio and the secondo passaggio in a female voice. Yes! Confusing, because I just said for male vocals we wouldn't use that terminology, but in females we would. The reason why is because for a soprano, for example, their middle voice can start here, E flat, the primo passaggio, and for a soprano, they may not exit their middle voice until there, that G. So there's a far, far wider space there, and there is in fact another transition point in the middle voice, separate from the area that is identified as the zona de passaggio. So middle voice 
and especially if you're if you're talking about me and in my teaching, when I use the phrase middle voice, I am talking about the space between the primo passaggio and the secondo passaggio for sopranos, mezzos, and altos. If I say zona de passaggio, then I am talking about that same space, the primo passaggio to the secondo passaggio, but it's male vocals. Female voices will have a zona de passaggio. It is considered to be about a perfect fourth below the secondo passaggio. So once again, if our sopranos have their secondo passaggio here, we would say that their primo, not their primo passaggio, their zona de passaggio is going to start around D as they approach the secondo passaggio. Their primo passaggio would still be down here. That's a little deep. I hope that the keyboard helps with that. But uh, if there are follow-ups, please leave them in the comments so I can address them. I realize that's a lot of notes and technical information. Hey, Jeff, what do you mean by narrow as we descend in the warm down exercise? Thank you for asking. That is a great question. And the easiest way to explain it would be to say that the notes should become as close to your speaking voice as you can while still maintaining good singing, good phonation. So if you got like really, really soft and it kind of cracked on you or it got airy, well, that's not what we're talking about here. This is particularly important on those warm downs or exercises where you are descending from the vicinity of the zona de passaggio. So for example, if I were going to sing a scale, this C sharp is just inside my zona de passaggio. So if I were singing A, I would be slightly modifying that vowel, getting ready for the transition that happens above it there at G flat F sharp. Now, as I descend, I have to remove that modification. And that is what we mean by narrowing. It is more dramatic the closer you get to the secondo passaggio because there is more modification that we are doing to the vowels. So even if I went a semitone higher, you can hear that A has a lot of eh sound to it, yeah? And there we get to narrow at the bottom. Again, it's still consistent with my tone quality throughout the rest of the scale. I am still maintaining good phonation, but I am removing the modification. I am narrowing as I descend. I hope that helps. I hope that answers your question. Great question. Little dog bark in there. If you pick that up, I'm not sure. When do I start noticing I'm getting better? Just to kind of have sense of when to level up a little bit more. Also, I'm taking singing classes once a week. They last 30 minutes, which I find not enough for me to really get into what is getting better at class. I stopped vocalizing like four weeks ago and took a Christmas break, but kept making songs and basically singing. Anyways... Thanks for your videos and giving me a sense of hope and to keep going. So very good question. And uh, one moment. Hopefully you're not getting any glug, glug, glugs in there. I'm probably going to have to pull this question up a few times. Getting a sense of your progress is difficult because the better you get, the likely hood is that you will hear more and more things that you want to work on. And so you can, in fact, keep on chasing an end point that you're not going to achieve. That's kind of part of what it is to be a musician. This is usually when I talk about Pablo Casal's quote. I know that I'm adjusting the quote slightly. Someone actually looked it up in an earlier video and posted it. But effectively, he was being interviewed, and they said, why do you still practice your scales at the age of 90? And he said, because I, I think I'm hearing progress. 
And that, that again, that's a paraphrase, but you see what I'm saying here. At the age of 90, after a lifetime of having a celebrated career as a cellist, he's still practicing his scales because he's still hearing progress, because his perception of his playing is so acute that he still hears things he wants to fix. And that is quite likely what will happen to you too. It happens to many of us. It certainly has is part of what it is to be me. I don't hear my voice probably the way anyone else does because I know what I want to work on, what I want to fix, what I am not satisfied with, what I think could be better, not in comparison to anyone else, but just for my own gratification. So how can you keep this in check? Record yourself would be one way and don't listen to it for like a week and then go listen to it and see how it strikes you. That can be one way to judge whether or not you're satisfied with making progress, like with with the progress that you're making. Usually when I go back and listen to my recordings, I approach them with a sense of horror and dread, and then I am pleasantly surprised. It's, you know, that's just the way it is for me. I hope it's not quite so dramatic for you, but that it might be. If the classes aren't really giving you enough, then you might just have to keep on singing after the class. I would heartily encourage you to reestablish your vocalization practice. You said you took a break over the holiday. I would encourage you to get back on the vocalization train. Vocalizations are what keep our technique moving forward. They are what keep us in good vocal health, full stop. They will keep your vowels aligned. They will make you aware of when problems are coming up so that you can attend to them quickly before they become a habit or a big, big problem or prevent you from singing something that you want to sing. Stay in your vocalizations. Get back, get back into the vocalizations if you can. Otherwise, good stuff, great work, singing and writing songs. I commend you for that. Keep going. And when you do, you know, like if you're going to release some stuff, then share a link with me through my website so I can have a listen. I'm always interested to hear what folks that participate in the channel are, are, what kind of music you're making. I think it's really exciting. So keep going. Good stuff. Carry on. And I think this is the last question. I have a question for you about singing volume or what listeners perceive as loudness. Is it usual for singers to have to increase volume as they go into head voice? Perhaps not at the F-sharp, G, and G-sharp. And actually, I would argue that yes, there too, of the tenor, but higher than that. I have always thought that when higher pitches are solely the result of tensing the vocalis muscles, sorry, I have always thought that when higher pitches are solely the result of tensing the vocalis muscle, it became necessary to really push the air through to vibrate the stiffer chords, folds. And this led to louder singing and soon to shouting the notes. But if you use the cricothyroids to lengthen the chords, is there still a role for increasing volume? I feel like I hear this in unamplified singers, but also in amplified singers, opera Broadway recitals. In a previous video, you mentioned some sort of volume adjustment you used and what we heard on the video was not exactly the volume we would hear if present in the studio. Do not remember exactly, so perhaps I missed what you meant. Not interested in belting here, but more about the lines of such as Sinatra, Roy Orbison, and even Domingo or Pavarotti. A great, very astute question, really great question. The key here is consistent sound. If you wish to have consistent sound, there is a baseline level of subglottic air pressure that is required for the vocal folds to work in the configurations as they change across the tessitura of our voices. So here, that base level subglottic air pressure is not all that dramatic. But as I said, I 
I have to increase my engagement as I ascend in order to keep the vocal fold flexible enough for it to elongate. If I don't increase that subglottic air pressure, then the vocalis muscle will take up the slack and start to tense up in order to produce the pitches that I am asking it to give. So all of these things work hand in hand. As we ascend, we require more subglottic air pressure. This allows for flexibility of the vocal fold. This allows for the vocal fold to remain adducted as the cricothyroid muscles elongate it longitudinally. It will in turn result in an increase in volume. If we do not wish to have consistent tone, or we don't care if we have consistent tone, then we can adjust the volume, but we will get a diff slightly different tone quality. Now, these are all within, there are certain like limits, right? Like there's a certain amount of volume that you have to work with that you will have consistent tone quality. And then once you get outside those boundaries, you will start to have to adjust the tone or the tone will adjust of its own accord because it doesn't have that same, doesn't have enough subglottic air pressure to work in the other configuration and you will get a difference in sound quality of your voice. It's a really, really good question. In some respects, the demonstration is, is much better than anything else. So here we are. Right up to my secondo passaggio and then back down. I'm gonna have a sip of water before I try to demonstrate this because I've been talking way too much to then expect myself to sing without at least hydrating a little bit. When we do this, If I want to maintain consistent tone quality, I'm gonna to have to increase in volume so that my vocal fold can stay flexible, so it can remain adducted, and the cricothyroids can elongate it effectively. If I don't do that, there I still could keep the cricoth I could still allow for cricothyroid elongation. I still kept them adducted, but it got really light, nearly airy. And if I reduce that engagement even more, there the vocal fold separated, it got lighter still, and I ran out of air because I was going slowly, and with the vocal fold separated, I lost a lot of air in that. Great question. I hope that explains it. If not, that's what the comments are for. Do let me know. As always, I love the questions. Thank you for being a part of the channel. Thank you again if you've subscribed and thank you if you've chosen to support my channel in some ways. And of course, that does include Patreon and all that info's in the description. And until next time, thank you very, very much. Take really good care of your voices. Enjoy singing. And hopefully we'll see you again. Bye.